cool. Well, thank you guys for um, joining me this afternoon. I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about uh, working with and managing code, uh, a little bit about performance, and then just really focusing on how we can all sort of write code we enjoy. Briefly, uh, about me, that's, that's me. It's, a, that's, it's supposed to be a cat suit. It looks like a mountain lion breeded with a rat. Uh, but but um, it's, it's a mountain rat. <laughs> wow. Uh, I work at Groupon. I'm a user interface engineer over there. Um, I teach front end design and development at the Starter League, which is formerly known as Code Academy. Has anyone heard of that by chance? Yeah? Is anyone signed up for it? So we're a different thing. It was a trick question. Uh, <laughs> We're, we're an in-person school in Chicago where we actually teach hands-on um, design, development, Ruby on Rails, UX, things like that. Um, I also help co-organize Refresh Chicago uh, as well. Uh, and if you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot me a, a message on Twitter or email. It's shay at groupon.com. Uh, or come up and, and, and see me after the talk. I'd be happy to talk to you guys. So I want to talk a bit about writing your code. And how many people have that experience where they, they sort of feel like when they're working inside of an application or on a website that, that the code is like just complete chaos and real fragile, right? Anybody? I'm surprised not everyone raised their hands. Uh, <laughs> you guys must be good developers. Um, but for me, sometimes it feels like I, I, I go in and I try and make just this, this one small change, and it feels sort of like I'm fighting just this storm. I'm in this boat, and I'm in this ship, and it's just going down. Like we're taking on water left and right. Um, and I had like just this little small change, but it's just completely like just wrecking my ship. Um, but we have like those good intentions, right? And we want to do like the best thing, but troubles quickly arise. So kind of why is that? I want to talk about this for a little bit. Some common problems I often see. Um, generally speaking, websites have a hard time of scaling well, right? And over time, basically the code base becomes it's brittle, it's bloated, uh, and just becomes really complex the more people that sort of gets their hands on it. Um, I feel like I'm working with spaghetti some days, and I really like I, I want Legos, right? I want pe things that can just sort of plug and play, and I can work my way through it. Um, but I don't always get that, and because of that, sort of just efficiency diminishes. My my happiness does, my productivity, uh, and that's just not mine. That's like the entire team across the board. So w what's wrong, right? We have some of these best practices, these perceived best practices. Um, they're not exactly best practices anymore. Um, they're treated as rules, sort of like they can't be broken, and we've never broken any rules, right? We're cool there. <laughs> um, but our languages and technology, things have evolved, and our standards need to do that as well, right? We've been told here that there, there are these, quote, best practices. Um, and a lot of these are focused at sort of separating our presentation from our context, right? Getting our styles out of our HTML. And I, I can get behind that. but. We've been told to do things like avoid you know, sort of unnecessary elements and sort of extraneous classes and, and really leverage selectors to do that, right? And, and just take any styles and really dry up our market, just extract that stuff out. Um, and this is good, but, but these rules are a bit ambiguous, right? And often sometimes they're taken too far uh, or, or too literal, right? Like has anyone seen like or heard someone brag about like I made a website and I didn't use any classes or IDs? That's crazy to me. It's like, it's obscure. Um, and I can get behind sort of removing like font and bold tags, things like that, like getting those that are strictly presentational elements out of HTML. But when we start talking about like extracting classes and sort of breaking that stuff apart, uh, I get a little weary about it. We start to do things like this, right? We write these long selectors and sort of really find ways to leverage and get our, our content in there without you know going too crazy. Um, but this is actually a really bad attempt at separating our presentation from our content, right? We're kind of doing exactly the opposite thing here. When we write code like this, our styles are so tightly bound to the document, it prohibits any change at all, right? I have this anchor, and it has a class of button, but what happens if I move that outside of the element with a class of feature, right? It completely breaks, so now I'm stuck making changes in my HTML and my CSS, right? What I was trying to do is not couple those together at all, that's all I've done. I've done an even worse job than I wanted to do before. These long selectors drive up the specificity, right? And performance sort of starts to take a hit and drag a little bit. And modularity of code, it just it, it doesn't work. It's decrippled at this point. So I say specificity. Who, who knows what that is offhand? Yeah? OK. 
For those that don't, uh, specificity is sort of how uh, CSS determines which styles are going to be applied to elements, right? Um, so every selector has a, has a weight of specificity, right? And the higher that weight is, those are the styles that are applied, right? But the important thing to sort of take away here is that we want a very low specificity. The lower, the better. And that really is what, what sort of creates this efficient code. Uh, and we're going to talk a bit about this today as we sort of go through. So we have these ships, right? And how do we get them in order? How do we sort of find that north star of what we want to accomplish with our code? And what's that baseline for this tactical HTML and CSS that we can sort of get on the right path and work towards, right? I believe it, it revolves around maintainability. And maintainability like at core, right? If our code isn't maintainable, what is it? What could we possibly accomplish without code that, that's maintainable, right? I can't scale the site. I certainly can't fix any bugs. I'm not gonna improve performance, right? I'm gonna quickly take down this ship every single time because the site's not maintainable, right? Andy Hume at South by Southwest last year, he said, websites change. We have to optimize for change. And I was sitting there and I was like, holy crap. It's like, <laughs> why didn't I think of that? Like, it's, it's simple, but it makes sense. We really think of websites as just as a static being. We have to stop doing that. We sort of have to sort of think about scale and extensibility and sort of this reliable code and things like that. Um, and I take maintainability, and I've sort of broken it down into these three parts. I have organization, uh, modularity, and then performance. And to, I'm going to go through each of these a little bit today and sort of say um, what I see to sort of be the perceived best practices inside of each one of these. So I'm going to start with organization. And I, I start with organization because it really sort of sets the tone and drives in uh, modularity and then performance, sort of wrapping those two together and, and packaging this up right. First off is the approach, right? We do this kind of bad and, and wrong. We think inside of pages, right? We think of that static website, and we sort of write styles that way, and we structure our code based around, well, what does this page need to do? What do I have to get done here right now? Um, but we can't do that. We have to start to break that concept down and think inside of components, right? How can I start modularizing my code and my styles here across the board, right? If we start to take visual inventory of what we have and sort of identify those components and abstractions, I mean, then we can build a library and start building off of that. Uh, and this is sort of what, what, what Bootstrap does, um, what Foundation does, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those too. So I have my organization broken down into these three groups. And this is, this is purely sort of my stance on it. You guys can do whatever you want. Um, the goal here is to just, just be organized and know sort of how you're working on it and sort of set that, stone, uh, that, excuse me, that tone with your team and work across that way. But, what I have here, I have base components and modules. Uh, and the base are sort of those, those core styles for, for everything. They're going to be used on every single page of the site, no matter what page that is. Um, and those are sort of like your normalized, maybe you guys use a reset, um, default styles for your typography, font sizes, weights, colors, things like that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Your grid and then variables, if you're using uh, a preprocessor of some sort and you're leveraging variables. Components then are sort of those user interface um, um, concepts and things that are driven out of the, the, the UI. Um, and those are the design patterns built into that. So alerts, buttons, forms, um, things like that. Modules then are our business logic components, right? Header, footer, things like that that are really dependent on the site and couldn't be shared um, with really anyone else or any other type of application. Um, and these components can be used inside of themselves. They can be used inside of modules, um, really all over the place. But one thing we have to do here is watch for sort of the unpredictable, right? We have to sort of like guess and try and see what the future might hold. Um, I do a bit of design. I do a bit of front end development. But there are people who, who strictly don't do design and, or, or don't do code specifically. Um, and we have to sort of keep those people on the same page, right? As a designer is comping something, we just sort of work from that visual library we've already established and built, right? If I start to see different styles for very similar elements, we need to unify those and use that same style. Let's not reinvent the wheel here. And I try and get everyone to sort of their instinct to not to be to write CSS, right? Like if we do this right, I should be able to go into a website application and start writing HTML. And if I do that right, it should inherit all the proper styles I need, basically pulling from that library. So um, I'm going to use RDO as an example here to sort of walk through what they kind of have going on. For base, uh, you can sort of see like their font sizes they have, the weights, the color here. 
the grid <clears throat> inside the bottom here. Um, their components might be something like this. They're that, the, um, the unordered list inside the, the navigation, buttons, pagination, um, things like that would be components, right? And then your modules look a bit like this, that header, that footer. And notice how those components are used inside the modules, as well as those base styles are used basically all over the place. So modularity then, how do we, how do we set the tone for this, right? We put a lot of attention and sort of work into the styles themselves, right? Like this text is going to be bold, it's going to be orange, it's gonna have this text shadow. And all that's well and great, but we don't really put a whole lot of effort into how those styles are applied, right? Those selectors don't get a whole lot of love. So I wanna work through those a little bit. Uh, and I think the first part of this is it sort of establishing a layout, right? Using a grid and sort of building off that foundation. Who here uses a grid by chance? Yeah. Does anyone just curse grids, not one of them at all? Yeah, you? All right, we can talk. Are you the only one? Really? All right, let's, let's, let's get a beer. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to change your mind, I hope. Um, <clears throat> but the point here is to sort of separate this presentation from the structure, right? Um, we have this theme, this skin to our website, but we sort of need to abstract um, the layout from it to an extent. And I'll show you what I mean by this. Who's written code that looks like this? Is anyone sitting there like, yeah, this is pretty good. Like, I, I, I write this on a daily basis. Uh, and that's OK, because I work with people who do this too. And I, I do this too, right? Um, I'm no, by any means, a saint here. Uh, but we have a few problems here, right? We have sort of that margin and width, that call them box model properties, if we will. Um, we kind of need to abstract those out, right? And, and our theme here, that background and those colors, um, that could sort of be pulled out separately too. We could do something like this. We separate the grid, and then we use this featured box class, right? And now anything I sort of want to fall in this grid, right, to be 400 pixels wide, I can reuse that class as much as I want, right? And sort of expand and based on that. Um, that featured box, maybe I want to reuse that. Maybe I have a news uh, modal, I have uh, social media modal, and I want to have those same styles. I can just sort of reuse that class as I work along. Um, and I'm sort of reusing these features without having to overwrite anything either, right? I'm not duplicating any code as I work here. Um, if the grid four becomes 500 pixels wide next week, that's okay. I'm gonna make that change in one area, not all across the code base. Some people might be like, man, I, I, I don't wanna put like just nasty class names on side of my elements. That's fine. Um, you can use SAS, SCSS, uh, different preprocessors to sort of extend this, right? We can build this grid four as sort of a, a silent class, so to speak, and then basically extend that inside of that featured box to set the width of it if we want. Uh, and we can sort of do this on a case-by-case -case basis as we sort of work through things. So we also need to accommodate our content then, right? Um, and, and part of this is removing that container dependency, right? We have these parent selectors. We need to try and get away from those when possible and just style elements just outright. Um, and doing so will sort of let us um, favor semantics and allow for better semantics. So we have this. Again, are you guys like, this is good? Yeah? So we have some problems here. Um, we're really coupling that heading to the featured box, right? And what happens when that H2 changes? We add more context into that box, and that H2 should become an H3. We get a problem then, right? Because now, again, we're having to change our HTML and our CSS. We could do this. We could just use a class on side of that. Um, and now it's not coupled to the parent at all. And this can sort of adapt with semantics as need be. It could be an H2. It could be a div. Doesn't matter anymore. We're using a class to sort of expand that. And this will adapt as we need it to. Um, and this is a little more performant in the long run. We might do things like this, too, where we say, hey, we have this featured box. But if that featured box is ever used inside an article, let's go ahead and change the styles of that. Um, and this location-based selector isn't great either, right? Because again, we're sort of driving up the specificity here. Uh, and not only that, we're sort of overriding the default. So we're basically initializing a style and then changing it right away, right? It's like me telling Keith to go get me a soda, and then when he gets here, like, I don't want it anymore. Um, he's not going to be happy with me. Um, so 
we're coupling these styles to the parent. We can, we can sort of get rid of that. We could do something a bit like this. We could just create a new class, make it an alternate, so that when it's used inside that article, we sort of change the style of it. Um, and this is a new class, just branched from the original. Uh, we're not overriding any properties here, and we're really building that more modular code inside of here. We might do something like this, too, where we have an alert. Again, is anyone like, this is, this is OK? I don't see the problem here. Um, the problem here is becomes we have more than one type of alert, right? Could be a success, warning, error, right? And we have all these styles sort of bound in together, right? And this doesn't allow for us to sort of make that more modular and break these apart. We should do something a bit like this, right? Where we take those sort of styles and, and break them apart for reuse, right? Those shared styles, those ones inside of alert, that border radius and padding, let's abstract those that we can reuse those across all the different types of alerts we have. We can create a new class just for errors, alert error, and expand based on top of that and change that background and color, right? Those theme-specific styles just based upon that specific error message. So if this was success or warning, we might have uh, a green background and green text or yellow or blue, depending on what type of alert we wanted to use here. Um, and again, the same way we did before, if we wanted to use SAS or something, so that way we could basically extend that alert class into every alert message, we could do that, and we wouldn't have to use multiple classes per element. Um, I'm a fan of doing it either way, really. I think this is actually pretty clean. It makes sense to me. Um, so I'm not opposed to doing it this way at all. I mentioned specificity, and um, we want to keep that low. And one of the best ways to do that is to be really explicit inside of our selectors. Uh, and one of the best ways to do that is to use classes, right? We have to understand a high specificity breaks the cascade, okay? And cascade's like one of the most beautiful parts of CSS, right? It's in the name. Um, but what we do if we're creating really specific selectors, um, as we start to write more styles below them inside the cascade, they won't even apply because they're being basically rewritten by a more specific selector above it completely breaks down the cascade. So we have to keep this low. And there's a few ways we can do that. Um, we can avoid using IDs. Um, we can sort of just avoid bang important at all cases. I don't think most people are going to argue with me about that. Um, and I don't see a big difference between IDs and bang important, right? They're both explicit. Nothing really trumps them, right? These two, in my book, are kind of mutually exclusive. Um, we can use these short selectors, right? I try and keep them four, three levels. Less than that, by all means. If I'm going past four levels, I, it's time to use a class. Hands down, I can use a class for that. So we get something that looks a bit like this, right? Why you would ever use two IDs and one selectors is like beyond me, right? Like, just think about it for a minute. Like, that's, it's explicit. We don't have to do that. Um, but this is getting too deep, right? And the browser is basically working backwards. So it's having to, for example, for the first one, it has to find that class of gallery, then locate the div, then work backwards, find that ID, find the next ID, right? And the specificity starts to grow over time. You can see in this case how it just starts to begin. It just creeps out of control, right? And before too long, it gets to the point where we don't even know really what selectors are taking precedence, like which ones are actually even being applied, right? We get so crazy down like this rabbit hole. Um, Things get ugly. We could just do this. We could just use classes outright. Um, and we're being really explicit here. Um, and these then can be sort of traversed and used on other elements anywhere inside the site, right? Again, we don't have that parent dependency. So it doesn't matter if this is inside an article, a div, section, anything of that nature. We can sort of reuse these wherever we want as needed. Um, and these are efficient, right? Not only are they module, excuse me, modular, but they're less work for the browser to render, too. The browser's not having to hunt down that sort of DOM tree and figure out exactly what styles to apply based on those really long selectors. So there's this formula, so to speak, for measuring specificity. Um, it includes around counting IDs, uh, and then classes, uh, pseudo classes, and attributes, and then elements, right? So if we look at something that has a high specificity, if we count the number of IDs in the selector, right, we have primary and main, so we'll put two on the board for that. Then let's count the classes, pseudo classes, and attributes. Well, we have gallery and then media, right? So we can put two on the board there. 
and then count the actual elements. We have a div and a figure, right? So we can sort of measure the specificity as 2, 2, 2, right? And it's important not to think of this as 202. That's not true. It's not an equal representation of that. If we look at the class, or uh, excuse me, the low specificity one, we just have that class, right? So we have zero IDs, one class, and then zero elements. So we have 0, 1, 0, right? Um, and I say these aren't to be interpreted as 222 or 10. Um, this is more or less just a, a general ballpark and gives you an idea of you really want to keep these numbers low. Um, the fact of the matter that, that in 10, it doesn't carry over, that one wouldn't carry over. So if I had 11 classes, that doesn't equal 110, right? I think we all understand that 11 classes isn't going to override an ID, right? An ID in this example would have um, a specificity of what you might call 100, right? 11 classes doesn't trump that. So we can't think of these as actual numbers. This isn't a direct relation. Um, but more or less, just this is ballpark for us to keep a, a good idea of what we're doing here. So using classes then, right? I think I've, I've sort of beat this into the ground a little bit. Um, but there's some things we can do in doing this, right? And we can use these sort of um, understandable class names. Harry Roberts, I think, says it best. He's like, class names are either sensible or nonsensible, right? It doesn't matter if they're semantic. It's not semantic. Browsers don't look at class names to be semantic, right? Let's think of them as sensible or non-sensible. Uh, and make those developer friendly, right? Write those for one another so that we can each understand what it is. Um, and let's not deeply nest or really combine these classes together either. Again, the goal here is to keep the specificity as low as possible. So we might see something like this. We have this featured box with the call out and then dot PR, whatever that may be. Um, and then we have this same thing, but then we have .un. Uh, and these are kind of unrecognizable class names, right? What is .un? And why are these nested so deeply among one another, right? Why is the specificity so high? What happens if I want to take .un and move it outside of .pr? What happens, right? Those styles won't be applied. So we sort of have these different levels of strength here as well. Again, this is compiling, and as it grows, it becomes uglier and uglier and uglier. It'd be better if we did something like this. If we have to nest these inside of a parent, we could just do featured box price, featured box unit, right? We have better names here. I can understand what these are and sort of recognize those on the page as well as inside the code. And there's no uh, added strength here, right? These are sitting at the same level. Price and unit, it doesn't matter that unit is actually inside of price, right? I don't need to put that inside my selector. My styles are going to get there either way. So keeping these on the same level, again, it sort of keeps that specificity low for us. Uh, and long term, this is more modular, more performant. We can do something like this. We have dot button, dot large. We can combine these two classes. And what our selector is saying here, that both of these classes have to be applied to that element for these styles to actually take effect. Um, but this isn't great either, because again, we're raising that specificity. Um, and the class name large is a bit ambiguous, right? We're using it in the case of a button here, but perhaps we have large images or we have large alerts, right? Large can be used all over the board. It's not great to use that same class name on different elements for sort of ambiguous reasons that we're not exactly quite sure why. It's as simple as just adding that dash, right? Just saying this is button large and being, again, explicit about this with the class. Um, we're using a better class name. It's the same strength, so we've sort of decreased that specificity by not combining these together. In the long run, it's more modular, and we can get more use out of this button. So I've talked a lot about this stuff. Um, and this stuff was sort of pioneered by Nicole Sullivan and Jonathan Snook. Um, Nicole built basically object-oriented CSS. Has anyone heard of that by chance? Yes? Cool. Has anyone heard of Smaxen, the scalable modular architecture for CSS? Cool. Um, these are amazing. Um, they're basically raising the awareness for everything I've sort of said thus far. Um, they're advocating maintaining ability at core, right? Like that's the heart of what a website should be. These guys are, are, are basically destroying it right now. I love everything that they're doing. Um, so I, I really encourage you to sort of check them out and follow what they're going on. So we have performance then, right? And performance is sort of that key. It's going to tie in our organization and our maintain, maintainability all together, right? Um, so inside of this, I have a few, few sort of guidelines I like to follow. Um, and the first one is just to reuse code as much as possible, right? Avoid any duplication as, as we can. Um, if there's any stale rules, clean them up. 
right? Like we're working on these massive code bases and sometimes there's so much code in there that it might not even be necessary, right? Sort of clean things up as you do it, right? Um, <laughs> so I, I think of my wife when I do this, like she's doing dishes, she'll like put like a dish on the coffee table and then walk into the kitchen to get something else, but like, why didn't you put the dish back in the sink? You're done, right? It's sort of like cleaning up after ourselves as we're doing other things. Yeah, she's gonna be really mad at me. Um, that's okay. Uh, so we need to sort of find these patterns, right? And, and remove any duplicate properties. If I see, find myself copying, pasting code, like I immediately stop. I'm like, what am I doing? I should never have to do that, right? I should find a way to reuse that code, make it more modular. Um, another part of reusing code, um, or, or excuse me, unused code is Defer loading of styles if possible, right? If your home page is the most important page in your site and you know that it gets the most traffic, perhaps defer loading the styles of some of your um, sub pages until users actually go there, right? Only load what you need to up front if possible. So inside of code reuse, um, we might have something like this, and this just like, it irks me a little bit. Um, these repetitive like declarations, uh, it just builds really bloated code, and over time this just, again, gets worse and worse. We could do something like this. We could create a selector and we could just sort of extend it with a comma uh, and sort of combine these two together. Uh, what would be better though is if we used a better name, a more modular name inside of it, and we could reuse that over and over as necessary. We wouldn't really have to go into our CSS and continue to basically grow that one selector based off of commas. So the other part to this is then minimizing requests, right? How many HTTP requests can we get down? Um, I don't know where I heard it or who told me, but they said, like, Shay, what's the fastest HTTP request? I was like, I don't know. And they're like, the one that's not made. Um, so what we can do here is we can combine files, right? Any of our CSS, JavaScript, let's sort of compress those down into one file each where we can, right? Um, and reduce the code weight of those. Uh, we can reduce some of these HTTP requests by using sprites and uh, data URIs and things of that nature, too. So. Image sprites, who's using sprites offhand? Very good, awesome. So this is kind of repetitive for you guys, but um, basically what we do is we make one HTTP request for a background image, right? And in this case, I use the icon class to sort of set that onto these spans. And then I use additional classes to sort of set the position of that background image only to expose what we actually need of it. Um, so the only thing being shown is that unique icon, what we have here. Um, so. My advice here, though, is just to, to, to sprite common images and don't go overboard, right? Don't take every background image you have on your site and condense that down into one to sprite, because then you're sort of going back to that old thing of just loading more than you actually need to for users, right? Find one small sort of sprite. Maybe it's just the footer of your page. Keep all those components together and sprite accordingly to those, not across the entire site. Data URIs. Is anyone using data URIs by chance? Yeah, a few of you guys? Cool. Data URIs are interesting because we can basically take that data from an image and use it inline, right? And this basically avoids any HTTP request at all. Um, and these work both in HTML and CSS. Uh, the only problem here is we have to sort of use these with caution, right? These are extremely difficult to edit. So if this is an image that you're, you're working on or tweaking from time to time, you're probably better off using it as a background image or just an inline image outright. Um, we have converters to sort of basically drop images in and then give us the basically data URI out of that. But if that's an image that's constantly changing, I wouldn't recommend doing this. Um, so use these with caution. So compressing files and caching files. Did anyone see the keynote this morning about caching? It was great. Um, and I, I can't echo what he said even more. Um, so two things I, I do, uh, I utilize gzip compression I cache my files, and then I also losslessly compress images. Um, and and uh, losslessly is basically reducing the size of images without like losing any of the quality inside of those. So who's using the HTML5 boilerplate? Yes? Great. So there's this HD access file in here. Um, and there's gzip compression built into this for us. Um, there's also caching in here for us, right? This works on most Apache servers. Um, generally speaking, you have the right modules and things turned on. Uh, but understand it's also in your host's sort of best interest to basically serve up files as quickly as possible and as small as possible for you as well. So doing some of this stuff, we can sort of cut down these file size uh, dramatically, right? I just 
quickly did a test, and again, this is going to vary based on what you do, but um, here I'm cutting things down about around about 60%, right? I'm going from 4.18 kilobytes in my HTML down to 1.65. Um, and you can see my CSS, again, I'm cutting that down substantially as well. Inside these images, this is <laughs> not going to work very well for you guys because of the projector. Um, but I do have my slides online. You can sort of go and see how this works. But I've taken this image, and originally it was 455 kilobytes, and I've compressed it down um, to 401, basically shaving off a little over 14%. Um, and the quality of this image hasn't changed at all. Right? The only thing these really compressors do is sort of go in there and remove um, comments and unnecessary like, color profiles that aren't being used inside the image. Um, there's, there's a few programs out there that can help you with this. Uh, one I use quite a bit is Image Optum. That's where you can see the screenshot here. Uh, that's specific to Mac. So it's OK, Windows people. I got you covered. Uh, there is PNG Gauntlet, right? And is anyone using CodeKit by chance? Yeah. CodeKit has some of this stuff built into it, too, as well. So we have these ships, right? And how do, we, how do we build these websites for the long haul then, right? We're going to focus on maintainability. We're going to keep our code organized, modular, performant. But where's sort of a good place to get started inside of this? Well, we can build a style guide, right? Twitter, Bootstrap, um, the foundation, they, they've done really good jobs of this. Go look at those and see how they've done it and, and sort of Copy what they've done to an extent. See what they've done and, and adapt that for yourself inside of your own projects where necessary. Um, again, that instinct shouldn't be to write new CSS. Like strive to get to that point where you can just write your HTML and your styles then are inherited on top of that. Review some of these methodologies I talk about, object-oriented CSS and the scalable uh, architecture for, excuse me, scalable and modular architecture for CSS. Uh, and then continually sort of test and refactor your code. Use CSS Lint, the inspector, page speed, tools like that to really drive up the performance of what you got. All right, thank you guys.